hello everybody you're all very welcome um lovely to to uh, to make your acquaintance all again nice to see some familiar names um we're back after the summer relaxed bronzed all of those things har har um and uh, I suppose we want to kick off our, our webinar series again. We've had great success with it um, over the, the summer period um, or over the, the, the previous period that we, that we carried it out. So we want to, to engage with you all again and maybe assist you as best we can in some of the key areas and, and areas of focus. Now, OK, so we're going to we complete a review of 24 HICWA reports that came out uh, quite recently. We'll get the details of that. Um, and we did a, a body of analysis on it. So what I want to present to you today is some of the findings that we identified through that and support some learnings for yourselves as you go forward in relation uh, to it. So you all know who we are at this stage. Um, you, we've, 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 we've told you all before, but we're the professional service providers for resident safety, regulatory compliance and quality improvement. So we have um, a, a quite a, a large body of quality and safety specialist and best practice specialist. That's the area particularly that I work in about ensuring that we have the evidence based best practice in all of the tools um, that HCI utilize. And through that, then we, su we support that through inf quality information systems through the likes of QPULS and, and electronic uh, records uh, systems to support analysis um, as we go forward. So why are, we, why are we doing this, I suppose? And, you know, what is the value of reviewing HICWA reports and seeing uh, what are the findings that are coming out of it? Well, this is a, a quote that I like, learning from the mistakes of others, learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. And we certainly don't want to make them all ourselves. And um, as the HICWA standards evolve and develop and as more of them come through, there is a greater emphasis all the time about learning and ensuring that learning internally from our, from our own activities and the outputs from our quality management system, uh, that's one, one stage. Of it. But if we go at another stage, um, it's taking information from our service generally, drawing it back into our own uh, situation and ensuring that we can try and implement preventive measures uh, to ensure that we don't run into the problems that others have experienced. So really trying to capture that learning and apply it within our own uh, services. So as we go through the, some of the problems that have been identified and issues, just be considered, I suppose, of your own service and, and ask yourselves, is this something um, that I would be exposed to or our service could be exposed to should HICWA have a particular focus in that area? So it's really just to kind of jog our memories out and, and freshen ourselves up as, as, we, as we face into to the new term on that. So there was 24 um, inspection reports randomly selected for this analysis. And all of these inspections were taken between April and June of this year. So they are quite recent. And from that, then we completed analysis of the key areas of interest. So we wanted to see what were the primary areas that HICWA were looking at on an ongoing basis. And from that, then, what were the types of findings that they were identifying within them. Now there's two of these tables are slightly blurry, but just in relation to this report and, and, and it looks like this, um, Rosemary will be issuing all the attendees um, a, a version of this. It's a PDF document and you will all receive that in your emails so that you can have more time to, to do some analysis and review of it. But this is the dimension from, from the, the, the capacity and capability dimension and the regulations relating to that. We looked at some of the key findings here. And I suppose there's just some a little bit of interesting information here. If we look at the first one that we've highlighted for staffing. So of the 24 uh, inspection reports we looked at, all of those were reviewed. All of them were reviewed. And of those, 92% were compliant, which is quite high. But the 4%... Um, 4% of the 8% overall were identified as very high risk. So they, they were flagged significantly. And we're going to look at what were some of the findings in relation to that. Other areas of interest, and if we look down that fully compliant line, you can see quite high numbers of fully compliant until possibly we come here, governance and management. So again, all 24 um, inspection uh, facilities 
were inspected against the governance management, which we would expect to see. And of that, only 33% of them achieving full compliance, where we had 38% uh, substantially, and then 29% in non-compliant orange, which is a significant chunk when you think that governance is something that is ongoing. You know, we all expect to, 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 to get it reviewed as part of our uh, HICWA inspections, but quite high numbers in relation to it. Um, again, other ones looked at complaints came up again, again, 22 of the 24 reviewed and of those 14% coming up as non-compliant orange. And we'll be looking at those findings in relation to records again, although 17 reviewed, but quite high, 30% 30, 30 of those not hitting the mark. Residence rights was something that came up and we'll be looking in detail again. You can see 23 of the 24 reviewed and of that 17% non-compliant with, with four hitting in the high risk. So that's certainly worth looking at. Other 24s, others that were consistently reviewed, your care plans and healthcare always uh, reviewed as part of the inspection process. Premises came through at 17. And although um, we only had 23 non-compliant, there was only 12% that received full compliance. So 65% of those facilities were not quite hitting the mark. They were deemed as substantially compliant. So that's an interesting thing. It seems to be an ongoing uh, issue in relation to it. Not surprisingly, infection control, all 24 um, facilities were inspected on that. And again, 42% only were fully compliant. But we have seen a movement up towards substantially compliant. Now, the last time we did this review, there was much higher levels of non-compliance uh, in relation to orange and red. But we have now moved up more towards the substantially compliant. So they can see a progression in that. Fire precautions, again, if you remember this, we did this previously, very high levels of non-conformance in this previously. And again, only 32% hitting the mark fully with 42% substantially compliant. But again, the concerns being 26 non-compliant with 5% of those being high risk and 21% being orange. Medicines again, although only seven, which is surprising, seven of the 24 were inspected in relation to that regulation. Again, only 29% of those being fully compliant. And I think what you'll see is, and if we monitor those trends, where there are higher levels of non-compliance, you'll have greater numbers of those regulatory uh, elements being inspected as we move forward. So that's some of the trends and analysis. And what we're going to do now is just spend a little bit of time looking behind that and see well, what were the actual findings in it. So just pulled out some of the high risk ones uh, that we're going to have a look at, and those that are carrying really the, the, the biggest levels of non-conformance in it. Those of you who know HCI won't be surprised to know that we're going to kick off with governance and management. But as we've seen, very few of the facilities that were inspected were really able to achieve full compliance in, in that regard. So let's have a look at some of those. So 29% of all of the, of the 24, all of them were reviewed against it. So in this, they found that roles and responsibilities of senior teams were not clearly defined and that there was a lack of communication between senior teams that impacted on the delivery of care to residents. So as far as they were concerned, that cohesive force that a governance, you know, the governance model should carry was certainly not there. And it wasn't clearly defined. There wasn't an understanding of the roles, the responsibilities that have to be carried within a governance model. And that lack of communication, that information was neither filtering down nor up into the governance model. And from that, the, the staff reported that they were receiving mixed instructions from different senior managers. So that cohesive force certainly wasn't there to be able to support that governance model. They identified that key information was not collected and analyzed to monitor the quality and safety of the service. The senior management team were unable to provide the inspector with accurate information around what residents had pressure sores, uh, what residents were in isolation, and how many residents were using bed rail. So again, that failing of communication and harnessing the data and information that's within our quality management system and drawing it up so that really the, the individuals in the senior management team have their fingers on the pulse. It's not good enough to say, well, that's being managed down on the floor. They expect the senior management team to have access and to actually spend the time analyzing the trends that are coming through uh, fr from the application of the quality management system. 
there was no trending of accidents and, and incidents to improve the safety. So again, the trending and the learning from those, uh, the, the, the trends that are coming through uh, was, wasn't, uh, wasn't being shown. There was an evidence of a lack of effective systems in place to monitor the infection control procedures, staff training, care planning and medication management. So what are they looking for when they talk about a lack of effective systems to monitor these things? Well, primarily, I suppose it's in relation to our audit practice, but also in relation to the supervision, be it daily, weekly, the monitoring elements um, that are being implemented. We're going to look at audit in a few minutes. There was a lack of oversight of staff files. Therefore, robust recruitment couldn't be assured and could lead to safeguarding issues. So gaps uh, in, in relation to staff files and again, roles and responsibilities not being clearly allocated to who needs to manage those staff files and ensure all of the content is, is up to date. There was evidence of poor oversight of staff training. So again, this is an ongoing issue where mandatory uh, training, that there's gaps in it in relation to the services and that it's being allowed to drag out, that it's not just a month or, or two months over, overdue, that it can be allowed to run six months overdue and that that training isn't being managed or monitored uh, in relation to it. This was an interesting one that there was a high turnover of staff and that was not reviewed and investigated and they found that as a, as a non-compliant orange. So they, they obviously recognized that there was a problem or there was a root cause in relation to that, that it wasn't being properly investigated and as a result, it could possibly impact on the quality and safety of the service that's being provided to the residents. Where concerns are expect, expressed in relation to the performance of staff, particularly on night duty, again, these weren't adequately investigated. And we've seen certainly a bigger push towards that um, serious, uh, serious incident investigation model and really people taking the reins of root cause analysis and then looking at the systems aspects um, of that and so really getting down to the actual root cause so that we can address it appropriately rather than just kind of smoothing over the top and saying retraining, whatever the case may be. Resources were not made available to maintain the resident's accommodation to a high standard and the premises was allowed to become dilapidated. So again, from a governance perspective, they identified that resources that the budgetary allocations were not being allocated, uh, appointed to, to maintain the premises. And they saw that as a failing within the governance uh, approach. The organizational structure of the center required review as a management structure set out in the statement of purpose was not accurate. <clears throat> and we all know that that isn't going to cut the mustard in relation to it. If we look at audits particularly, which, which falls under the governance uh, regulation, they saw that there was a lack of evidence to show that audits were used to inform service improvements. And in many cases, I suppose, um, it, it can be an incident that audits become a tick box exercise. Say, yeah, I check that, check that. That's a very different thing, uh, you know, than, than actually completing um, an effective, cohesive audit. So they're looking for that audit practice to be much more robust and drive improvements within the service. Um, again, audits being done with no action plans are coming from them. So if the, the work is done, they expect those action plans to drive out through them and that roles and responsibilities are directly allocated for those actions to be implemented. Management systems for monitoring and, high, and auditing hygiene and infection control had not identified inconsistencies within cleaning practices or adequately assessed the cleaning of the facility. So obviously HICO went into the facility, they identified that there were serious problems uh, in, in hygiene and infection control. The service was completing audits from their perspective, and yet they weren't able to identify the same problems that HICWA had identified. So they again were saying, your audits are not robust enough, they're not detailed enough, um, and, and they're not picking up on the problems that are there. And again, not time-bound actions related to it. So audits being done, possibly corrective actions being identified, but they just roll on and on and on and nobody's responsible and they're not, they're not time bound to make sure that those actions are, are, are implemented. I want to have a quick look at residents' rights and although we had um, uh, smaller numbers in relation to the non-conformances, the red risks are obviously uh, of particular concern. So in this case, the inspector found that a uh, non-compliance resident was evidenced by a failure to risk assess a resident's uh, psychosocial well-being and to develop a professional, appropriate, and person-centered care plan. 
So they saw that as a primary fail, that that risk assessment wasn't being implemented um, to ensure that the residents' rights were being protected. They saw a failure to communicate effectively with residents in relation to opportunities for activity and social engagement. So again, we're coming out of that uh, period of, of um, intense restriction and they're certainly looking to re-engage individuals uh, with opportunities for activity and social engagement, which I, I can absolutely identify remains a challenge, but they're certainly pushing in that direction. And they saw a failure in uh, to identify and facilitate the access to those advocacy services. And in many cases, it's about rebooting the models that were in place pre-COVID and to try it. Now, they may never be the same again, but to be uh, to, to certainly push towards a process where we have that much more cohesive supports for residents' rights and ensuring that they're, they're central and giving the, the external supports that are required uh, to do that. The identified improvements were required to ensure resident meetings were being held more frequently and obtain the views of residents. Records reviewed by the inspector did not contain feedback from the residents. So again, it's about re-engaging that process and ensuring that our, our service is, is, is person focused. Uh, ensuring all residents living in the centre had access to facilities, again, for occupation and uh, recreation. So engaging again to drive the, the, the quality of life and, and the activities that are there to support it. From a privacy and dignity, dignity perspective, portable privacy screens um, obstructed access to a number of residents' toilets and shower facilities when they were put in place uh, to, to provide res other residents with privacy during personal care. So obviously the flow and layout of the, of the facilities was lacking. An observation window in the nurse's station provided a view into the male multi-occupancy room. A blind was in place, but it wasn't effective to promote the residents' rights to privacy. And privacy was not assured by the arrangements in place where bedrooms shared shower and toilet facilities. So you can see how premises and residents' rights are obviously leaking into each other and, 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 and uh, having knock-on effects in that regard. Although, again, quite small numbers of uh, the, of the um, inspection reports reviewed carried med medicines and, and pharmaceutical services, I think some of them are quite important to, to, to flag up. Inspectors found evidence that staff were not adhering to the medication management guidance for nurses set out in the NBMI. So as we know, the NBMI released um, a new guidance for medication administration. It was about August, September 2020. So it's really important that we take the time to ensure that our medication management policies and procedures are reflective of those NBMI guidances um, and ensure that it incorporates the, the 10 rights and, and, uh, of, of administration. So that's something to flag. In one case, medications were being administered to a small number of residents in an altered format, such as crushed. The inspector noticed that these medications had not been individually prescribed to be crushed by the GP. As a result, a high-risk medication, which was unsuitable for crushing, was being administered in this form. And a full review of prescription medications in altered format was required. So again, we can recognize that that was a pretty serious uh, area that needed to be addressed immediately. The count of control drugs was not accurate. And again, this is something that we see on an ongoing basis coming up um, in, in our HICWA inspection reports, where the controlled drugs really do not have the structured processes in place to ensure uh, the, the safety of, of use. The medication that had been administered had not been recorded in the drugs count. And in addition, another control medication uh, which was stored in the control drugs cupboard was not recorded as part of the daily count. So a general lack of, of controls and, and, and an effective system in place in that regard. Medications that have been discontinued by a GP remained on the administration record sheet and staff had administered a number of medicines without uh, signed prescriptions. So again, uh, that is again something that is a repeat and a primary concern of focus uh, in that regard. Now, fire precautions, we've seen a lot of in the last one, the last of these summary uh, webinars that we've done. So let's see what progress has been made. Now, again, in this area, red risks are coming up. Um, so it, that's that's hardly surprising with the, with the focus. And, and those of you who have um, um, taken part in the, the fire safety review um, webinar that we, we completed in relation to the HICWA guidelines, it's not surprising to see this. They identified that 
a full review of the management and oversight of fire precautions was required. So really that um, HICWA guidance hadn't been taken on board and that governance model that we spoke at length about hadn't been implemented to ensure the oversight of the fire precautions. They identified that a fire evacuation plan did not provide information about the different fire compartments. And we also talked about getting that external support uh, from fire safety experts to ensure that uh, we have a, a proper approach um, to the fire evacuation plans and drills. In another case, the uh, personal emergency evacuation plans were not readily accessible to staff in the event of an emergency. So again, many cases, lots of lovely documentation prepared and held in the shelf in somebody's office. Um, well, obviously, they want to see those, those documents being readily accessible to staff. There was no rec recorded evidence of simulated full compartment evacuation drills. So drills really being front and centre of the requirements that are there. And these weren't taking account of the staffing levels and the resident evacuation requirements. Of the fire drills completed, they didn't include time, timed actions, analysis and, re, and remedial actions taken. So again, not that cohesive approach to fire drills that the, the HICWA guidance was certainly looking for. Some of the fire drill records did not provide information regarding the number of residents evacuated, the number of staff involved, and there were no recent records of nighttime scenarios. And certainly that is of primary importance that we do incorporate a nighttime scenario for our fire drills. Not all staff members were involved in the simulated evacuation. There were gaps noted between fire doors when these were closed and the smoke brush had been painted over. Um, and then other fire doors were missing either portions or all of the required heat and smoke seals around the head and sides of the fire doors. So these are some of the, just the sample of the issues that were coming up in relation to it. A fire door was wedged open with a bin. Pipes that were penetrating ceilings had no fire stopping. A toilet had been repurposed as a storeroom but did not have a smoke sensor. Fire equipment was not provided in the designated smoking room and then fire training was out of date for some staff members. So we have a quite a wide span of issues that were coming up uh, in relation to fire. Um, so important to consider all of those and your services application to address them. As I said, premises, again, very low numbers of compliance in relation to it. Um, some of the areas that came up, residents had less than two square metres communal space available to them that did not uh, enable them to sit together in the sitting room. So again, linking with that uh, residents' rights, and privacy and dignity. Residents did not have access to a dining area. And surprisingly, the number of times that, that this comes up uh, throughout the review of the inspection reports. Floor covering was worn and damaged and surfaces were uneven. That led to the, the floors could not, have been, could not be cleaned to the appropriate standard and the damaged flooring was a risk to safety of residents. Walls and wooden surfaces were stained, damaged and paintwork was peeling or missing. It was chipped from arms of chairs. The laundry and the, the layout of it containing washing machines and dryer did not permit unidirectional flow of used and contamination uh, linen. So again, ensuring that we have that process flow uh, from clean to, to co contaminated. There were inadequate storage facilities and residence toilets and showers were not available as they were inappropriately being used as storage areas. So all of these identified as areas of concern. Infection control then, if we look at that, again, 21% of the 24 reviewed having non-conformance, but a significant number, um, I think it was uh, over 70% in total, had some areas of either non-conformance or sub substantially, uh, only substantially compliant. So there was a lack of clarity amongst management and staff about the isolation status of residents, and the designated isolation area was not effective uh, in, 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 from their perspective in minimizing the risk of infection. And it also did not adhere to those HPSC um, guidance, uh, the, the guidance documents that are there, which are still fully applicable um, in relation to our management um, in, in relation to isolation. There are no dedicated, there were no dedicated staff for residents in isolation. The same staff are seen to attend to residents in precautionary isolation as well as other residents. Now, I know there are demands in relation to the resources and people on the floor, but they identify that as a primary concern and, and a non-compliant non orange issue. Donning and doffing of PPE was carried out in the same room 
and there was no segregation of these functions, which could lead to cross contamination. And certainly with the learnings that we've had over the, the, the last um, 18 months or so, we know that that's certainly a non runner. There were no clinical waste bins either inside or directly outside of isolation rooms to allow for immediate disposal of PPE. Three hand hygiene sinks in the corridors were not working, including the sink on the isolation unit. Household staff finished at three and there was no evidence of cleaning or high touch areas after this time. So again, linking in with our, our, our cleaning schedule and the frequencies related to it, and they identified the sluice room was not clean and required review. Some equipment was rusted. There was a number of toilet seats in the sluice room that were not clean and had stains under the surface. There were insufficient local assurance mechanisms in place to ensure that equipment was cleaned in accordance to best practice. So again, that cleaning schedule and the frequency and monitoring uh, coming to the fore there. Um, and again, they had some issues about the residential centre not being visibly clean. I just pull this up because these are some of the particular cleaning procedures uh, that they identified being inconsistent in relation to the national standards for the infection prevention and control in the community. So they are actively drawing and actively referencing those national standards. Uh, so it's really important that we get a handle on those and be able to apply them within our services. So examples of that, no colour coded cloths, one cleaning sponge used in multiple rooms, chemicals not being diluted as recommended, trolley not being organized into clean and dirty, uh, the procedure not being appropriately documented um, and it was not available for review and staff not being supervised and supported uh, in relation to their roles. So it's really important that we have an adequate level of focus and monitoring in relation to our cleaning process. Surprising that records came out quite high 30% of the 17 reviewed having non-compliant non orange findings. So some of the areas, files for newly recruited staff required review, two written references, evidence of the person's identity and details for training certificates were not available in some of the files reviewed. Training matrices and uh, training certificates, again, not available for review. The duty roster did not include full names of staff, the specific roles of staff, and did not identify the nurse in charge on all shifts. So they are looking for full details in relation to the duty ro register, a roster. The DNR uh, orders were not clearly documented. Um, some of the documentation review did not indicate how the decision was made, the date of the decision, the rationale for it, and who was involved in the decision. So again, a much more comprehensive approach required in relation to the DNR. There were a number of key documents missing from staff files, references, CVs. There was no record of current registration with the nursing body. And I know that's something that comes up uh, quite regularly. A gap in a CV, so in relation to their history and uh, employment history. Some staff members not having references. Some staff members having references from colleges as opposed to an employer. Uh, one staff member who was roster reviewed did not have guard the vetting certs or employment references on file. Another staff member's guard the vetting cert was attained at a date after they commenced duty in the residential centre. And again, fortunately, that's something that seems to come up on an ongoing basis within the reports. We, we talked about the staff rosters, storage and accessibility of photographs of wounds are required to review in, to ensure they're in compliance with the data protection requirements. And again, we have to re-engage our brains in a lot of other areas that maybe have been left to the side a little bit, but certainly with those GDPR requirements, we need to be very mindful um, of the, 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 the personal data um, and records that are and, and ensuring that they're maintained securely. Current systems for management of resident contracts required review uh, to ensure that records of the residents' charges and any extra amount payables were retained on the premises. Briefly in relation to protection, um, but obviously a, a, a very serious area that requires our focus, allegations of abuse were not always investigated in relation to the residential centre's own safeguarding policy. And we've seen this again, where we have services that have excellent policies and procedures, but it's in the application of those, particularly in relation to an allegation of abuse, things can fall apart very quickly. Um, it's a very, you know, it's, it's something that requires a lot of a delicate approach, but a tenacity of focus in relation to it and in many cases the policy and procedure can fall by the wayside so we need to be very very careful uh, in our approach and ensure that we're implementing the policies and procedures uh, for our services.
Adequate records were not available to demonstrate that all allegations were fully investigated. Not all authorities that were required to be notified were notified in relation to allegations of abuse. And safeguarding care plans were not always put in place in instance where residents' behaviour may suggest the need for such a care plan. So again, being proactive in our application of the care plans for safeguarding where we identified that there is vulnerabilities there for a resident and not waiting for a problem to occur, being proactive in its application. Just briefly in relation to other areas of non-compliance that flagged up, Again, care, individual assessment and, and care planning, of all 24 uh, carried um, review in, in relation to this regulation, but they identified 16 of the 24 had orange non-compliance issues where care plans were not in place for all identified issues. They were not informative or person-centered. They did not guide the care of the residents. Risk assessments weren't seen to be a driver to inform those care plans. There was no system in place to record evidence of involvement in the resident and or their relatives uh, in the development of the care plan. So we certainly need to, to ensure their engagement and, and, the, and the central focus of that care plan development. And there was a clear lack of direction in relation to end of life care preferences. And certainly that is an area of focus as we go forward in relation to, to end of life. Other findings, they didn't have com comprehensive care plans completed within the required time frame of, of no later than 48 hours. They did not easily direct the care um, and some of the care plans were outdated and no longer relevant to the needs. So there, obviously that review and evaluation of care plans was not being effective. A number of residents had incomplete or blank assessments in care plans. These included no mobility, no dependency or no skin care assessments or care plans to direct residents care. Assessments were not always used correctly and when assessing residents at risk of developing pressure ulcers, validated assessment tools were not being utilised and you know that is central where we have validated assessment tools available that we implement them within our services. One thing that came up in relation to complaint and I suppose this is something that arises from HICWA engaging with uh, residents and getting their, their feedback and, and spending some time talking to the residents. An ongoing complaint was made by residents regarding an issue that was causing distress and affecting their quality of life but this was not documented in line with the resident centre policy. So uh, a, a, low, a, a low level grumbling that was going on and had gone on for quite some time and it had then really started to impact on the quality uh, of life of the resident and was not being managed in, control, in, in accordance to the services um, complaints policy. In training and, and staff development, we saw that a number of the household staff did not receive cleaning training up, upon a commencement of their posts in 2020, and they only did this infection training in 2021. Um, so that is, is certainly something that needed to be addressed and that obviously impacts then on the effectiveness of, of the cleaning uh, process implemented. Significant gaps were identified in relation to training records for basic life support, management of responsive behaviours and safeguarding to prevent uh, older person abuse. In healthcare, uh, inspectors found the recommended medical treatment and professional expertise from allied healthcare professionals was not consistently followed. So referrals were being made, um, feedback was being received, but it wasn't being incorporated into the individual's care plans. And a resident who was receiving uh, subcut fluids did not have a valid prescription from a GP. So again, linking back into our medication findings. For notification of incidents, quarterly notifications or six monthly uh, notifications had not been received in the 18 months prior to inspection. We really have to ensure that we stay on top of our quarterly no notifications and our six monthly notifications, irrespective of anything else that, that, that is going on. And from a staffing perspective, although a very small number, it was identified as a red risk, the residential centre did not ensure adequate staffing levels were in place to meet the needs of the residents for the size and layout of the residential centre, something we've seen before. Important to note, there were a number of regulations that were deemed fully compliant, so there were no findings. Now you'll notice they're quite small numbers, but apart from visits, 22 of the 24 were inspected against uh, Regulation 11, and all of those were found to be compliant. So, you know, there has there was a, a large number of guidance documents released in relation to visiting, but they found evidence of really good compliance in that regard. 
some of the resident feedback that came back from the from some of the 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 uh, reports that we looked at residents stated they missed their families during restrictions but they're happy now to be able to see them again now that restrictions are lifting they said their staff were attentive respectful of their choices kind caring some residents commented on the frequency of changes made to the residential team management center which i thought was quite interesting that you know that it's, it's the residents are very aware of the changes that are going on even from a managerial perspective and it's very important that they're engaged with and, and certainly as part of that residential uh, or the residents team that they're engaged with and, and that communications are made quite clearly so that there isn't a sense of unease or anxiety in relation to uh, this how the service is being provided and, and its consistency as they go forward some residents come to that some staff were unfamiliar to them and that's a lot of staff members were new so again the change, the anxiety that that can carry with it. So again, really important to have that level of communication. Some residents outlined that the quality of food varied significantly throughout the week. And I suppose that's something that, that can be an ongoing issue. So that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I hope it, uh, it highlights some of the key areas of focus over the last number of months by HICWA. We will we complete these on a quarterly basis, so we will continue to, to flag up some of the, the findings that are there. From ourselves, we have, as you know from previous attendances, our care tools, hciCareTools.com, and uh, there are individual documents that are available to you in relation to policies and procedures, audit tools and forms. And Rosemary has been so kind and she's given a coupon code for 15% of all documents purchased for the 8th of October 2021. And if any of you have any queries or questions in relation to the Care Tools package, Rosemary would be happy to, uh, to, to answer your questions on that. So I hope it's of value. As I said, take it with you. Think about it. Look at some of those findings. Rosemary will be issuing you out all uh, our, the, the formal PDF document. You can take it as your nighttime reading for today. And um, just really take that time. I mean, what we want to be able to show Hiku is that we are open to learnings, you know, that we are taking information, not just internally, but we are looking externally to benchmark ourselves against other facilities and draw in the findings and said, we don't want to be making all the mistakes or ourselves. We want to be learning from the mistakes already made and ensuring that we have proactive. What I would say is, have a quick look at your risk registers in relation to any of these findings, particularly um, uh, consider if you have appropriate controls in place or if it's something that you need to beef up on to ensure that when they come to your door, that there will be um, adequate controls in place in relation to it. And we will see you all again in early November for policy and procedure training. It's going to be so exciting. It's going to rock your world. Um, and. Uh, Really, that's it. And Rosemary will be in touch with the PDF. Thank you.